Praise the Lord, Pastor Michael Jackson. Welcome once again to The Bible Speaks Live, coming to you with a word for your heart and for your soul. We pray that all is well with you tonight. We come to you, as always, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We bless him and we honor him and we thank him for all that he is doing in our midst. Keep your eyes to the skies, ladies and gentlemen, because Jesus Christ is coming back soon. Amen. We are streaming right now live over Facebook and YouTube and Periscope and Twitter. You can also go to our website at thatstheword.org. And you can go to our YouTube channel, That's the Word Ministries. And while you're there, uh, you can subscribe to our channel if you so desire. Amen. And so we pray that all will continue to be well with you tonight. Always to mention that we have written a book entitled The Lights in the Windows, Eight Basic and Powerful Principles on Evangelism. It's available on Amazon.com. And I pray that you pick up your copy today. Amen. It will bless your heart. Now, tonight. Tonight, we are going to continue uh, in our series on the Sermon on the Mount, keeping it real straight talk from Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And we're going to jump. We're going we're gonna to begin uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, but we're going to move to another portion of Scripture, also from the book of Matthew. Uh, but it will tie in nicely with what we're going to talk about tonight. Amen. So if you are watching right now over Facebook, uh, why don't you just take the time out, if you so desire, uh, to share this page, uh, that others also, uh, may be blessed, um, take the time out to do that. And we will get right into our study for tonight. Let's pray. Lord, we bless your name. We thank you for being with us tonight. And Lord, we pray that you might be the silent listener to all that we do and say, Lord, someone needs to hear this word, Lord Jesus, Lord, someone who does not know you, Lord Jesus, or someone who believes they may know you, Lord, I pray that you may draw them to this place on the world wide web. Lord, have your way. Bless us together right now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's go to the book of Matthew. Matthew. We're in. We're going to begin in chapter number seven. We're winding down our study uh, in uh, this, on the Sermon on the Mount. But let's start here in Matthew chapter number seven, and let's go right to it. I want to talk to you from my heart, from my heart today. Uh, and I would just want to talk about for a few minutes, I want to talk about the most precious, the most precious pearl, the most precious pearl. I'm wondering if you know what that pearl is. Amen. Matthew, let's start in Matthew chapter number six, and we'll quickly move to another portion of scripture. Verse no, Matthew chapter seven, I'm sorry. Let's start in verse number six. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. He's there, is talking about pearls and that which is holy. And he says, don't give what is holy to dogs and don't uh, cast your pearls before swine. Now, dogs and swine uh, are indications of those who do not want the gospel, as opposed to unbelievers. Now, they there are unbelievers and there are unbelievers. The dogs and the swine, and, and this is biblical language, dogs and swine, because uh, even in these ancient days, dogs and swine were, were scavengers, pigs and and and. And dogs were considered scavengers. Uh, no one had uh, dogs for pets in those days. They roamed the streets looking for what they could get, uh, sometimes being very ferocious. Uh, and swine, the Jews had no dealings uh, with pigs at all. So dogs and swine in this society at that particular time were looked down upon. So uh, Jesus gives this illustration. He says, don't give what is holy and don't give your pearls to dogs or swine, individuals who won't appreciate it, individuals who do not want it, individuals who have indicated to you that they want no part of what you are trying to give them. Now, what is the pearl? What are these pearls? Let's go to the book of Matthew. Let's stay here. Let's go a few pages down to chapter number 13. Chapter number 13, Matthew chapter 13, and let's start in uh, verse number 45. 
It says again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who, when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. This pearl, this pearl of great price, this most precious pearl. And notice that Jesus is making the connection. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like that merchant. Now, what makes the kingdom of heaven all that it is? It is the gospel. It is Christ. And you cannot separate Christ from the gospel. He is the gospel himself. Uh, the Bible says that this gospel, this gospel is the power of God. It is in uh, uh, Romans uh, chapter number one and verse number 16, uh, that I am not ashamed. It says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. What is he saying there? He said that this gospel, this gospel is what causes people to be saved. Yes, your testimony can make a difference. What the Lord has done for you in your life can make a difference, but it is the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And that word is found in the gospel, the gospel. And so we must be very careful reverting back to uh, chapter number seven. We must be very careful how we treat this most precious pearl. How do we treat it? How do you take care of the gospel? What do you do with it? Do you understand the preciousness of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Once again, it is the power of God unto salvation to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Let me go to the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter number 1. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. Powerful, powerful scripture here talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ and how this gospel sometimes uh, is received by the world. Talking about those uh, that we just spoke about in chapter number seven, in starting in verse number 17. For Christ sent me not, this is Paul the Apostle speaking, he says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. So what is he saying? The gospel is the cross of Christ. What is the cross of Christ? It is that place. It is that place. It is the event. Uh, which took place years ago on a hill called Golgotha where Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world. That is the cross. So he says that the gospel is the cross, which is, uh, which is, and let's go down to verse number 18. It, he continues, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is, once again he repeats, as he said in Romans, it is the power of God. You and I who are saved and born again, we know this cross, this gospel to be the power of God. It has changed our life. It has changed our life drastically. We are not the people that we used to be. That is the power of the gospel. As we've been preaching on Wednesday nights, the gospel changes. It changes. It changes not just it changes not just our heart, but it changes our mind. It changes our outlook. It changes everything about us when we are genuinely saved, genuinely saved. That's why we must treat this gospel properly. We must treat it right. We must not hold on to it. Hey, we must not be selfish about the gospel. Everyone needs to hear the word of God. Everyone needs to hear what Jesus has done. And I know the world. The world doesn't really care. The world doesn't understand. Once again, what do we read here? Uh, uh, the preaching of the cross or the word of the cross or the message of the cross is to them that perish, those who are not born again. It is foolishness. They don't understand. They don't get it. And so it says here uh, that we are saved through this power, through what the world calls foolish. The, the Lord has saved us. And so, as we said earlier, don't hold it to yourself. Don't hold this power to yourself. You see, it is through the power of the Holy Ghost that we read about in the book of Acts. 
Acts chapter number one, that the Lord gives us the ability. He gives us the empowerment to preach this gospel. What does it say in Acts chapter number one? Let's go to Acts uh, chapter number one. Acts chapter number one and verse number eight. But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. What is the purpose of of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Now, let me just say this. The baptism of the Holy Ghost, as glorious as it is, it's not all about you and I speaking in tongues. Okay, that's not what it's all about. The speaking in tongues is the initial physical evidence, but there is a reason, there is a purpose for tongues. There is a purpose. It, it, it does empower us, but the coming of the Holy Ghost into our hearts and lives, it says, you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. You say, well, I'll never get to those places. I've never been to those places. So how can I be a witness? What is he talking about? Where you are, where you are, we are all located. God has strategically planted his people in various places around the globe. And where you are is your Jerusalem. Where you are is your Samaria. Where you are is that place where the Lord has put you. The place where you are right now. And we've said this recently. The place where you are right now is the very place where God wants you to be. I know you might fight against it and say, no, I, I, I need to be in another place. I, I know the Lord is calling me here. The Lord may be calling you uh, uh, someplace. But where you are right now, it is not a mistake. Where you find yourself is not a mistake. You see, God's people, uh, God's people uh, may be displaced, but God's people are never misplaced, okay? He may move you from place to place, but each place you are is the place where he has set you. And while you are in that particular place, you are to be a witness wherever you go. I don't know how you go about being a witness, but you are to be a witness wherever you go. So you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost is come upon you. It's not for your own glorification. It's not to make you look good. It's not even to make you feel good. The purpose of the Holy Ghost coming upon you is so that you can be a witness, a witness. Because you are, you are an ambassador. You are an ambassador. Once again, we're talking about how we treat the gospel. How are we to treat the gospel? This most precious pearl, this, this thing, this thing, and I, I'm being very careful when I'm calling it a thing. It's not a thing, but this entity that we have, that the Lord has given to us, how we treat it is very important. No, the Lord is not going to snatch uh, his power from us. No, he's not going to do that. But we need to be very careful how we approach. Now, once again, going back to chapter number seven of the book of Matthew, there will be those who do not want to hear. There will be those who do not want anything to do with Jesus. Not one single bit. So we must be very discerning. We must be very discerning. That is something that we must allow the Lord, allow the Lord to do in our life. Give us hearts to discern. Give us heart to discern. And the only way that you're going to be able to discern as you ought is to expose yourself to the word of God. How much have you exposed yourself to the word of God? How much do you read? How much do you allow the word of God to, to speak into your heart? The more the spirit of God speaks through your heart, through the word of God, the more discernment that you will have. And so we must make sure that we are discerning even as we speak to others about Jesus. Even as we live before them, we must be discerning because we must not be holy pests. Holy pests. We must not, we must not strive to make our point. We must not force. We cannot push the gospel on anyone. We must not be a nuisance. No, that's not our purpose. Our purpose is not to be nuisances. Our purpose is to preach the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. In love. How do you preach? How do you speak the truth in love? By saying 
the word just as the Lord has given it to you. That's how we do it. That's how we do it. When we look, once again, we go to the book of Acts and we go, we're going to go to Acts chapter number 26. You see, because here, here's the truth. Uh, your mission, your mission in this life is the same mission that Jesus has uh, had in his life here uh, on earth. The very same one. Here's, here's, here's the reason why we must be very, very, uh, very, very consistent in bringing the gospel forth to those who don't know the word of, don't know the, uh, don't know the gospel. Uh, Acts chapter number 26, uh, verse uh, number 20, verse number 16, Acts 26, verse 16. This is the Lord. Uh, uh, this is Paul, the apostle rather speaking. Uh, we read about his conversion uh, in Acts chapter nine, I believe, but it's not a full, Paul does not give us the full encounter that he had with Jesus there. He does, he does, as as he's on that ground, as the, the light from heaven knocked him off uh, of that horse or that camel or however he was traveling, uh, the Bible says that he says, who are you, Lord? And Jesus says, I am Jesus who you persecute. And then immediately he says, what do you want me to do? The conversion was done. What do you want me to do? And that was the short version. And when Jesus told him what he wanted him to do, he so wanted him to go and he would be met by a man and he would pray for him and the scales would fall off of his eyes. But here is the long version of what happened to Paul the apostle on the Damascus road. 26, Acts 26, 16, but rise and stand upon thy feet for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen and of those things in which I will appear unto thee. Throughout your life, the Lord is going to reveal things to you. The closer you get to the Lord, the more you become, uh, 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 the more uh, uh, the more intimate you become with him, he will begin to reveal himself more and more. I know this is Paul's uh, personal uh, uh, personal uh, revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. But once again, you and I will also experience times in our life where the Lord will speak to us and speak to our hearts. Verse number 17, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee. He says he will deliver him. Notice what it says from the people. Why would Jesus make that statement? I'm going to deliver you from the people because the people he would go to would not initially hear him. They will not hear him and they will not hear you and I either. You see, this gospel message, this gospel message is so powerful. It is so powerful that Satan has blinded the minds of those who do not believe that they should not see the light of this glorious gospel. It is a glorious gospel. And Satan has done his work. Satan has done his work in the hearts and lives of people that they just do not see. So he says, I will deliver you from the people. The very people I send you to are the very people that I'm going to have to deliver you from. Everyone is not going to hear. But here's what he says in verse number seven, verse number 18, Acts 26, 18, to open their eyes, to open their eyes. You see, that's what this most precious pearl, the gospel, that's what it does. It opens the eyes of those who are blind, opens their eyes. It says, and to turn them from darkness to light. Have you noticed the darkness in the world? Have you noticed it? There is a darkness, and I'm and I'm and, and I'm speaking, speaking from my heart. There is a darkness that is and has, but even more pronounced. It, there is a darkness that is descending upon this world. A darkness. It is a thick darkness. It is a thick satanic darkness. Once again, the devil is doing his work. The devil is doing what he does. Remember, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. There is a battle taking place above our heads. 
and the darkness is descending. Now, once again, when I talk about the darkness descending, hey, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is triumphant and will be triumphant. People, in spite of the darkness, in spite of this present darkness, this gospel will continue to go forth and it will continue to do what it does. It will continue to open up the eyes of those who are blind. It will continue to turn them from darkness to light. It says here, from the power of Satan unto God, the gospel that the church preaches will continue to do this. It says here that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith which is in me. We must have the gospel message right. If we say that this gospel message, the kingdom of heaven, which it, the gospel message, which is contained, which is all a part of the kingdom of heaven, if we say that we believe it, then we must make sure that we preach it right. We must preach it right. We must make sure that we have our P's and Q's in place. There are many messages. There are many teachings that are going here and there, doctrines of devils, seducing spirits that are here. They are in place. And many of these doctrines of devils and, and these seducing spirits, all of these things, they have tried to corrupt the true, the true gospel that it doesn't mean what it says anymore. We must make sure that we do not, that we must make sure rather that we keep the gospel message pure because this is a pearl of great price. Now, if you'll notice, if you'll notice uh, in the book, it uh, back in Matthew chapter number uh, 13, back in Matthew number thir uh, chapter number 13, uh, when we see this merchant, this merchant, this merchant here in Acts 13, he represents, he represents that individual who is seeking, that individual who is searching. And even though, even though this merchant uh, can be said to be someone who is well off, he's a merchant, he's a seller of goods, he has things that he wants, but yet and still we find that he is searching for something more something more. You see, this tells us that everyone in this life is not satisfied. Everyone is not satisfied. There is a longing. There is something. There is a, there is as one, uh, as one theologian put it years ago, uh, there is a God-shaped vacuum inside of every person. And we must make sure that we, the people of God, be able to detect and discern when we when we confront someone who is searching, actively searching. Now, let me bring you to another scripture where the Bible says that no uh that no one searches after God. I believe it's in the book of Isaiah. No one searches after God. Everyone has gone his own way. We uh, uh, all we like sheep have gone astray. Everyone has gone his own way, but God has laid on Jesus the iniquity of us all. And yes, that that is the basic condition of man: selfish, wanting their own way, believing that they know what's right for themselves. That is the basic condition of man. But yet there are those that there is a flicker. There is a flicker. They understand that there is something more. We see this. Uh, we see this. In scripture, we see this in scripture in several places. Uh, when we look, uh, when we look at uh, what's his name, <laughs> what's his name? Uh, when we look at <clears throat> when we look at uh, oh, the name just left my left my spirit, left my spirit. That's why I had to write it down. The Ethiopian eunuch. The Ethiopian eunuch. When we see this eunuch, when we see him for the first time, we see him searching the scriptures, searching the scriptures. And Philip comes up alongside him and begins to tell him about who Jesus is. He doesn't understand. He is searching. He is searching. There are yet still people who are searching, searching for something more, for something more. We read about Cornelius in Acts chapter number 10. 
He was another individual who was doing good, doing good work. And you would think from a distance that this man was a man of God. And he would probably say of himself, he was a man of God. He had a good reputation. He would he prayed much. He gave alms. He, he did all these things. But yet and still, what was most important was missing from his life. And that was a relationship with Jesus Christ. He was religious. And had, had Cornelius died in that condition, he would have not gone to heaven. And so you see, there are individuals who are searching. And when we see this parable of, of the pearl of great price, we see this merchant man, he is searching, searching for something more, searching for something more. And it says in verse number 46, who when he had found one pearl, one pearl of great price, he found, he found what he believed, what he knew was it, was it. And I don't know how you came to the Lord. If you are listening and watching tonight and you know the Lord, I don't know how you came to the Lord. I know how I came to the Lord. I did not initially, I was a hard sell. If I may use that phrase, I was a hard sell. I did not initially hear the word of God and run to it and receive it. I was not searching for the Lord when I found myself in the presence of, of the gospel for the first time in my life. I was not searching for anything. I was very, very, and I'll say very one more time. I was very self-righteous. How can you be self-righteous at age 14? 14 years old, and I was already, had already formed the opinion that I had done nothing wrong. How can that happen? Yes, I had formed that opinion that I had done nothing wrong because I associated I associated sin, I associated uh, evil with those who were locked up in jail, who had murdered and done terrible things. And I knew of myself that I had done none of those things. So how am I a sinner? I've never killed anyone. I've never really hurt anyone. I am not a sinner. And I, and I really, and I thought that it was all about the fact that if you're a good person, that if there is a heaven, you would go. And one of the things that I did to prove, to prove just how righteous I was and how much I was unaffected by all this God talk that I, uh, that I was hearing, uh, even before I started going to church, before I started going to church, I had a friend of mine uh, who was, he was actually a Jehovah's Witness. And once again, I didn't know anything about that. All I knew is that he talked about God a lot and I really wasn't trying to hear him. But some one day uh, he was talking to me about the spirit world. And I don't know how much, I don't know how much uh, Jehovah's Witnesses knew about that or whatever, but he was talking to me about demons and angels and evil spirits. And it was, it was for me at that time, I was about 12, 13 years old. It was hilarious. I mean, it was hilarious to me, the things that he was saying. And I was making fun of him and laughing and everything. And I remember we came home, we had gone somewhere and we were coming home and he went his way and I went mine and I came home. I was a latchkey kid. I came in the house with my key. No one was home. And I stood in my living room. I stood in my living room, age, about age 12 or 13. And I stood there and I looked up in the ceiling, to the ceiling, call myself looking up to heaven. Why am I looking up? I don't know. But I said, demons, come and get me. Demons, come and get me. I said that. Out of absolute, total, obvious ignorance. I didn't know what I was saying, but I was sort of trying to say all of this talk about Demons and angels and all this stuff is nonsense. And I said, demons, come and get me. And I stood there, bold and proud, and waited. What's going to happen? Nothing. Nothing. Except a couple of seconds later, I heard... Knocking 
on a wall. I lived in that house all my life. And I heard knocking on ceiling and walls. And I had never heard that before. And you know what I did. I did as the Bible says that Joseph did in Genesis uh, chapter 39. I got myself out. I left and I didn't go back home until my mother got home from work. But you see the ignorance, the absolute ignorance that was in my heart at that time. I had wanted no part of, of the God that he was talking about. I had no respect for things that were holy and whatever. Once again, we know that Jehovah's Witnesses are not Christians at all, but what he was saying to me was something new and it was foreign and it was just something that was totally ridiculous to my young mind. But two years later, the Lord would get a hold of me. He would get a hold of me and I would hear the gospel for the first time. And when confronted with the gospel for the first time, it was through Romans chapter six and verse number 23. Well, like I said, when I first heard the gospel, I said, it's not me. I'm not a sinner. I'm all right. I'm nothing wrong with me. But Romans 6, 23, it gnawed at me for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. That scripture would not let me go. And the more I would hear that scripture, the more I would, because I would go to church every Sunday. I was going all for the wrong reasons, but I was going to church every Sunday. But that scripture stayed with me, stayed with me. And I tried and I began to get more involved in some of the things that I was doing at that time. Trying to get myself, not trying to get myself in trouble, but I was definitely going to get myself in deep trouble if I would have continued in the way I was going. Why the Lord chose to pull me out, I have no idea. I don't have any idea to this day, except I know it was the grace of God. Why he pulled me out and many, if not all of those friends, nearly all of those, those individuals that I was with uh, during that time in my life, they are no longer with us. And many of them have died in bad ways. Why did he take me out? God's grace. Bless the Lord for his grace. But when he got a hold of me, when he got a hold of me, he changed my heart, changed my mind, changed my thinking, changed everything about me. And that's what the gospel will do. That's why we must be bold, bold as we speak the gospel, as we preach the gospel, as we let others know that Jesus is the answer, not just the answer. He, he is the only answer that there is. It is the cross of Jesus Christ. And once an individual, once an individual receives the Lord, receives this pearl uh, of great price, uh, we can read uh, in John chapter number one, uh, ja John chapter number one, where it says, As many to as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them which believe on his name. As many as received him. That, once again, the gospel, the gospel, that pearl of great price. There are so many people that are reaching, that are searching, that are looking that are unsatisfied and they have all that they want, but yet still something is missing. Something is missing. This merchant man, he sees, he finds this pearl of great price and he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now, by no means is this trying to say that the gospel can be bought or sold because it cannot. This, uh, uh, this, uh, 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 these words are only meant to say that he gave up all that he had. There is a sacrifice that happens when we receive the gospel. We are exchanging. We are exchanging our corrupt lives for holy lives. We give up ourselves 
That's what happens when we come to the Lord. That's what happens. And we must make sure that we preach this gospel, that we teach this gospel, that we go into all of the world, which is our world, and preach this gospel. That's what we must do. There are so many people. If we look at Luke, once again, talking about, we talked about Paul's, uh, Paul's mission statement that the Lord gave him. But look at Jesus' own mission statement that the Lord gave him. This is the Lord's mission statement. Compare what Jesus said of himself and what he would eventually tell Paul that his mission would be. Uh, Luke chapter four and verse number 18, but the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel, preach the gospel to the poor. Uh, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and to recover uh, the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. The two, the two mission statements are very similar because that's what the Christian is supposed to do. We are to do as Jesus did on this earth. Now, we're not going to get it right. Jesus had the spirit without measure. We were talking about being filled with the spirit. Jesus had the spirit without measure. He did not have a sin nature. He was not corrupted. And so the spirit of God was able to move through him freely. We don't have that, not yet. We won't be perfect until we get into his presence. But we still must propagate, proclaim this gospel. We must still do it. As you always hear me say, as we bring this to a close tonight, we are ambassadors, ambassadors with a message. Be reconciled to God. Notice what Jesus says here in verse number 18. He has sent me to preach the gospel, the gospel, not politics, not social justice, not to preach any of those things, to preach the gospel to the poor, to those who, who know their need, who know their need, who understand that there's something more, to those people like the merchant, to those individuals uh, like Cornelius, to those individuals like uh, the uh, even the Philippian jailer who we didn't mention, who said, what must I do to be saved? We must preach the gospel to those, and we must be discerning enough to realize when someone is ready to hear and be willing to step back when someone does not want any part. Yes, there are times when we need to step back and relinquish. Paul made a statement. Paul made a statement in the book of Acts where he said, since he told, he told the Jews, uh, since you have uh, found yourself unworthy of eternal life. We we will move on to the Gentiles. Some people, some people through the blindness that is present in their in their in their hearts, in their minds, they have disqualified themselves temporarily. At least we hope uh, they have a uh, 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 they have caused themselves to be out of the running if I can use that phrase, of receiving the Lord. They have been, they have counted themselves unworthy. Now they are worthy. They are worthy. Jesus died for them, but they set themselves apart. They don't want it. Once again, speaking about those individuals that we spoke about in chapter number seven of Matthew, dogs, swines. Now, every unbeliever is not a dog or a swine. Let's Let's make that perfectly clear. Once again, there's a differentiation between uh, an unbeliever who is simply someone who does not, who is not saved because they've never received the Lord. But there is a certain level of rejection that happens. A certain level. I've seen things on social media. I've seen things on social media from people that I knew years ago. And, and some of the things that I've seen them say and some of the things that they've posted 
let me know. Let me know completely that they want nothing to do with Jesus Christ. Nothing to do with it. They ridicule Jesus. They make fun of Jesus. They make jokes about Jesus. Yes and no. Yes, these people, uh, I have not unfriended them, uh, as the as the saying goes. But they have pushed themselves away from receiving Christ. So these individuals, we have to be very careful and don't push Christ on them. Because they're going to come back at you with that same uh, type of uh, same type of fire, and it won't be pleasant. So you leave certain people alone. You just leave them alone. And leave them in God's hands. God sees the heart. God knows the heart. God knows how to get at somebody. God knows. There have been people that have been so far away from God. There have been people that I know in my life that have worshipped the devil involved in all sorts of evil and now they're saved and born again living for jesus so i know what jesus can do and so when somebody is so far away we must not write them off we mustn't write them off jesus is able the holy ghost is able to save so we must treat this pearl this most precious pearl, the gospel. We must treat it right. We must deliver it properly so that others may hear. So Lord, we bless your name tonight. We thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your people, Lord Jesus. Lord, there are some who will hear this word on a replay, Lord Jesus, and they don't know you, Lord Jesus. They don't know you at all. Lord, we pray that you will have your way, Lord Jesus. Lord, we pray that you will speak to every heart, Lord Jesus, who comes across uh, these words, Lord Jesus. Lord, we pray that you will have your way. Lord, bless and keep. Continue to use us, Lord, to use that one who is watching and listening, Lord, and Lord Jesus, and, and really has never spoken to anyone about Jesus. Lord, I pray you will use them, Lord Jesus. Lord, open up their hearts to receive from you, I pray. Fill them with your precious Holy Ghost that they may begin to use and to proclaim this pearl of great price, which is the gospel. Lord, have your way in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. We bless the name of the Lord. We bless the name of the Lord. We thank him for what he is doing uh, in our midst. Amen. God is good. Listen, Jesus, Jesus' ministry should be our ministry. Amen. Jesus' ministry on this earth should be our ministry. What he was committed to do should be what we are committed to do. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. Amen. So we just bless the Lord and we just thank him. We honor him because we know that he is able. We serve a God who is able. Amen. Amen. You can find all of our podcasts that we have produced and continue to produce. You can find them on several podcast platforms, including Podcast Addict, CastBox, uh, iHeartRadio, iTunes, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, uh, Spotify, and many others. Amen. You can also go to our YouTube channel. That's the word ministries. And you can become uh, one of the growing uh, family of subscribers that we do have. You can also go to our website at that's the word.org. Amen. And so we pray that you continue to support us as we continue to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, we want you to be on the lookout uh, for some new studies that we have. These studies will be based in doctrine, theology, uh, and uh, and biblical theology, systematic theology, practical theology. Uh, yes, we're going in and we're, we're going to touch on these subjects. Uh, and we pray that you will watch for them on our one of our other podcasts, which is the That's the Word Ministries School of the Bible. Look for these studies coming very soon. Amen. They will be available on those podcast uh, platforms that I just mentioned and many others. Amen. So once again, we thank you and we bless the Lord for what he is doing. Amen. Don't forget to join us tomorrow night as we continue our series, Metamorphosis, the Dynamics of Biblical change. Amen. Tomorrow night, we're going to talk about the challenge of change in a corrupt society. 
How can we be expected to continually uh, to be changed, uh, continually grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord, even in the midst of this world that we are living in? Yes, you can. So we're going to be talking about that tomorrow night. Do not forget to join us. We'll be here at 8.30 p.m. Am. Amen. I'm Pastor Michael Jakes. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time. May God bless you.